Chapters 41 and 42 of A Short History of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short History of the United States by Edward Channing. Chapter 41. The End of the War. 1864 to 1865. 422. Grant in command of all the armies. Vicksburg and Chattanooga campaigns marked out Grant for the chief command. Hitherto, the Union forces had acted on no well-thought-out plan. Now Grant was appointed lieutenant general and placed in command of all the armies of the United States, March 1864. He decided to carry on the war in Virginia in person. Western operations he entrusted to Sherman, with Thomas in command of the Army of the Cumberland. Sheridan came with Grant to Virginia and led the cavalry of the Army of the Potomac. We will first follow Sherman and Thomas and the Western armies. 423. The Atlanta Campaign, 1864. Sherman had 100,000 veterans, led by Thomas, McPherson, and Schofield. Joseph E. Johnston, who succeeded Bragg, had fewer men, but he occupied strongly fortified positions. Yet, week by week, Sherman forced him back, till, after two months of steady fighting, Johnston found himself in the vicinity of Atlanta. This was the most important manufacturing center in the South. The Confederates must keep Atlanta if they possibly could. Johnston plainly could not stop Sherman, so Hood was appointed in his place in the expectation that he would fight. Hood fought his best. Again and again he attacked Sherman, only to be beaten off with heavy loss. He then abandoned Atlanta to save his army. From May to September, Sherman lost 22,000 men, but the Confederates lost 35,000 men, and Atlanta, too. 424. Plans of Campaign Hood now led his army northward to Tennessee. But Sherman, instead of following him, sent only Thomas and Schofield. Sherman knew that the Confederacy was a mere shell. Its heart had been destroyed. What would be the result of a grand march through Georgia to the seacoast, and then northward through the Carolinas to Virginia? Would not this unopposed march show the people of the North, of the South, and of Europe that further resistance was useless? Sherman thought that it would and that once in Virginia, he could help Grant crush Lee. Grant agreed with Sherman and told him to carry out his plans. But first we must see what happened to Thomas and Hood. 425. Thomas and Hood, 1864. Never dreaming that Sherman was not in pursuit, Hood marched rapidly northward until he had crossed the Tennessee. He then spent three weeks in resting his tired soldiers and in gathering supplies, this delay gave Thomas time to draw in recruits. At last, Hood attacked Schofield at Franklin on November 30, 1864. Schofield retreated to Nashville, where Thomas was with the bulk of his army, and Hood followed. Thomas took all the time he needed to complete his preparations. Grant felt anxious at his delay and ordered him to fight, but Thomas would not fight until he was ready. At length, on December 15th, he struck the blow, and in two days of fighting, destroyed Hood's whole army. This was the last great battle in the West. 426. Marching Through Georgia Destroying the mills and factories of Atlanta, Sherman set out for the seashore. He had 60,000 men with him. They were all veterans and marched along as if on a holiday excursion. Spreading out over a line of sixty miles, they gathered everything eatable within reach. Every now and then, they would stop and destroy a railroad. This they did by taking up the rails, heating them up in the middle, on fires of burning sleepers, and then twisting them around the nearest trees. In this way, they cut a gap sixty miles long in the railroad communication between the half-starved army of northern Virginia and the storehouses of southern Georgia. On December 10, 1864, Sherman reached the sea. Ten days later, he captured Savannah and presented it to the nation as a Christmas gift. Sherman and Thomas, between them, had struck a fearful blow at the Confederacy. How had it fared with Grant? 
Grant in Virginia, 1864. Grant had with him in Virginia the Army of the Potomac, under Meade, the Ninth Corps under Burnside, and a great cavalry force under Sheridan. In addition, General Butler was on the James River with some 30,000 men. Lee had under his orders about one-half as many soldiers as had Grant. In every other respect, the advantage was on his side. Grant's plan of campaign was to move by his left from the Rappahannock southeastwardly. He expected to push Lee southward and hoped to destroy his army. Butler, on his part, was to move up the James. By this plan, Grant could always be near navigable water and could in this way easily supply his army with food and military stores. The great objection to this scheme of invasion was that it gave Lee shorter lines of march to all important points. This fact and their superior knowledge of the country gave the Confederates an advantage which largely made up for their lack in numbers. 428. The Wilderness May 1864. On May 4th and 5th, the Union Army crossed the Rapidan and marched southward through the wilderness. It soon found itself very near the scene of the disastrous battle of Chancellorsville. The woods were thick and full of underbrush. Clearings were few, and the roads were fewer still. On ground like this, Lee attacked the Union Army. Everything was in favor of the attacker, for it was impossible to foresee his blows or to get men quickly to any threatened spot. Nevertheless, Grant fought four days. Then he skillfully removed the army and marched by his left to Spotsylvania Courthouse. 429. Spotsylvania, May 1864. Lee reached Spotsylvania first and fortified his position. For days, fearful combats went on. One point in the Confederate line, called the Salient, was taken and retaken over and over again. The loss of life was awful, and Grant could not push Lee back. So, on May 20th, he again set out on his march by the left and directed his army to the North Anna. But Lee was again before him and held such a strong position that it was useless to attack him. 4.30. To the James. June 1864. Grant again withdrew his army and resumed his southward march. But when he reached Cold Harbor, Lee was again strongly fortified. Both armies were now on the ground of the Peninsular Campaign. For two weeks, Grant attacked again and again. Then, on June 11th, he took up his march for the last time. On June 15th, the Union soldiers reached the banks of the James River below the junction of the Appomattox. But, owing to some misunderstanding, Petersburg had not been seized, so Lee established himself there, and the campaign took on the form of a siege. In these campaigns from the Rapidon to the James, Grant lost and killed, wounded and missing, 60,000 men. Lee's loss was much less. How much less is not known. 431. Petersburg, June to December, 1864. Petersburg guarded the roads leading from Richmond to the south. It was, in reality, a part of the defenses of Richmond, for if these roads passed out of Confederate control, the Confederate capital would have to be abandoned. It was necessary for Lee to keep Petersburg. Grant, on the other hand, wished to gain the roads south of Petersburg. He lengthened his line, but each extension was met by a similar extension of the Confederate line. This process could not go on forever. The Confederacy was getting worn out. No more men could be sent to Lee. Sooner or later, his line would become so weak that Grant could break through. Then, Petersburg and Richmond must be abandoned. Two years before, when Richmond was threatened by McClellan, Lee had secured the removal of the Army of the Potomac by a sudden movement toward Washington. He now detached Jubal Early with a formidable force and sent him through the Shenandoah Valley to Washington. 432. Sheridan's Valley Campaigns, 1864. The conditions now were very unlike the conditions of 1862. Now, Grant was in command instead of McClellan or Pope. He controlled the movements of all the armies without interference from Washington. And he had many more men than Lee. 
without letting go his hold on petersburg grant sent two army corps by water to washington early was an able and active soldier but he delayed his attack on washington until soldiers came from the james he then withdrew to the shenandoah valley grant now gave sheridan forty thousand infantry and fifteen thousand cavalry and sent him to the valley with orders to drive early out and to destroy all supplies in the valley which could be used by another southern army splendidly sheridan did his work at one time when he was away the confederates surprised the union army but hearing the roar of the battle sheridan rode rapidly to the front as he rode along the fugitives turned back the confederates surprised in their turn were swept from the field and sent whirling up the valley in wild confusion october nineteenth eighteen sixty four then sheridan destroyed everything that could be of service to another invading army and rejoined grant at petersburg in the november following this great feat of arms lincoln was re-elected president four thirty three the blockade and the cruisers eighteen sixty three to sixty four the blockade had now become stricter than ever for by august eighteen sixty four Farragut had carried his fleet into Mobile Bay and had closed it to commerce. Sherman had taken Savannah. Early in 1865, Charleston was abandoned, for Sherman had it at his mercy, and Terry captured Wilmington. The South was now absolutely dependent on its own resources, and the end could not be far off. On the open sea, with England's aid, a few vessels flew the Confederate flag. The best known of these vessels was the Alabama, she was built in england armed with english guns and largely manned by englishmen on june nineteenth eighteen sixty four the united states ship kearsarge sank off cherbourg france englishmen were also building two ironclad battleships for the confederates but the american minister at london mr charles francis adams said that if they were allowed to sail it would be war the english government thereupon bought the vessels 434. Sherman's March Through the Carolinas, 1865. Early in 1865, Sherman set out on the worst part of his great march. He now directed his steps northward from Savannah toward Virginia. The Confederates prepared to meet him, but Sherman set out before they expected him and thus gained a clear path for the first part of his journey. Joseph E. Johnston now took command of the forces opposed to Sherman and did everything he could to stop him. At one moment, it seemed as if he might succeed. He almost crushed the forward end of Sherman's army before the rest of the soldiers could be brought to its rescue. But Sherman's veterans were too old soldiers to be easily defeated. They first beat back the enemy in front, and when another force appeared in the rear, they jumped to the other side of their field breastworks and defeated that force also. Knight then put an end to the combat and by morning the Union force was too strong to be attacked. Pressing on, Sherman reached Goldsboro in North Carolina. There he was joined by Terry from Wilmington and by Schofield from Tennessee. Sherman now was strong enough to beat any Confederate army. He moved to Raleigh and completely cut Lee's communications with South Carolina and Georgia in April 1865. 435. Appomattox april eighteen sixty five the end of the confederacy was now plainly in sight lee's men were starving they were constantly deserting either to go to the aid of their perishing families or to obtain food from the union army as soon as the roads were fit for marching grant set his one hundred and twenty thousand men once more in motion his object was to gain the rear of lee's army and to force him to abandon petersburg a last despairing attack on the Union Center only increased Grant's vigor. On April 1st, Sheridan, with his cavalry and an infantry corps, seized five forks in the rear of Petersburg and could not be driven away. Petersburg and Richmond were abandoned. Lee tried to escape to the mountains, but now the Union soldiers marched faster than the starving Southerners. Sheridan, outstripping them, placed his men across their path at Appomattox Courthouse. There was nothing left save surrender. The soldiers of the Army of Northern Virginia, now only 37,000 strong, laid down their arms. April ninth, 
1865. Soon, Johnston surrendered, and the remaining small isolated bands of Confederates were run down and captured. 436. Lincoln murdered, April 14, 1865. The national armies were victorious. President Lincoln, never grander or wiser than in the moment of victory, stood alone between the southern people and the northern extremists, clamoring for vengeance. On the night of April 14th, he was murdered by a sympathizer with slave and secession. No one old enough to remember the morning of April 15, 1865, will ever forget the horror aroused in the North by this unholy murder. In the beginning, Lincoln had been a party leader. In the end, the simple grandeur of his nature had won for him a place in the hearts of the American people that no other man has ever gained. He was indeed the greatest, because the most typical of Americans. Vice President Andrew Johnson, a war Democrat from Tennessee, became president. The vanquished secessionists were soon to taste the bitter dregs of the cup of defeat. End of chapter 41 Part 14 Reconstruction and Reunion, 1865-1888 to 1888. Chapter 42 President Johnson and Reconstruction, 1861 to 1869. 437. Lincoln's Reconstruction Policy. The great question now before the country was what should be done with the southern states and people, and what should be done with the freedmen. On these questions, people were not agreed. Some people thought the states were indestructible, that they could not secede or get out of the Union. Others thought the southern states had been conquered and should be treated as part of the national domain. Lincoln thought that it was useless to go into these questions. The southern states were out of the proper practical relations with the Union. That was clear enough. The thing to do, therefore, was to restore proper practical relations as quickly and quietly as possible. In December 1863, Lincoln had offered a pardon to all persons with some exceptions, who should take the oath of allegiance to the United States, and should promise to support the Constitution and the Emancipation Proclamation. Whenever one-tenth of the voters in any of the Confederate states should do these things, and should set up a Republican form of government, Lincoln promised to recognize that government as the state government. But the admission to Congress of senators and representatives from such a reconstructed state would rest with Congress. Several states were reconstructed on this plan, but public opinion was opposed to this quiet reorganization of the seceded states. The people trusted Lincoln, however, and had he lived, he might have induced them to accept this plan. 438. President Johnson's Reconstruction Plan Johnson was an able man and a patriot, but he had none of Lincoln's wise patience. He had none of Lincoln's tact and humor in dealing with men, on the contrary, he always lost his temper when opposed. Although he was a Southerner, he hated slavery and slave owners. On the other hand, he had a Southerner's contempt for the Negroes. He practically adopted Lincoln's Reconstruction policy and tried to bring about the reorganization of the seceded states by presidential action. 439. The 13th Amendment, 1865. President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had freed the slaves in those states and parts of states which were in rebellion against the national government. It had not freed the slaves in the loyal states. It had not destroyed slavery as an institution. Any state could reestablish slavery whenever it chose. Slavery could be prohibited only by an amendment to the Constitution. So, the 13th Amendment was adopted December 1865. This amendment declares that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. In this way, slavery came to an end throughout the United States. 440. Congress and the President, 1865-66. to Unhappily, many of the old slave states had passed laws to compel the Negroes to work, they had introduced a system of forced labor, which was about the same thing as slavery. In December 1865, the new Congress met. The Republicans were in the majority. They refused to admit 
the senators and representatives from the reorganized southern states and at once set to work to pass laws for the protection of the negroes in march eighteen sixty five while the war was still going on and while lincoln was alive congress had established the freedmen's bureau to look after the interest of the negroes congress now february eighteen sixty six passed a bill to continue the bureau and to give it much more power johnson promptly vetoed the bill in the following july congress passed another bill to continue the freedmen's bureau in this bill the officers of the bureau were given greatly enlarged powers the education of the blacks was provided for and the army might be used to compel obedience to the law johnson vetoed this bill also 441 the fourteenth amendment while this contest over the freedmen's bureau was going on congress passed the civil rights bill to protect the freedmen this bill provided that cases concerning the civil rights of the freedmen should be heard in the united states courts instead of in the state courts johnson thought that congress had no power to do this he vetoed the bill and congress passed it over his veto congress then drew up the fourteenth amendment this forbade the states to abridge the rights of the citizens white or black it further provided that the representation of any state in congress should be diminished whenever it denied the franchise to any one except for taking part in the rebellion finally it guaranteed the debt of the united states and declared all debts incurred in support of rebellion null and void every southern state except tennessee refused to accept this amendment 442 the reconstruction act 1867 the congressional elections of november eighteen sixty six were greatly in favor of the republicans the republican members of congress felt that this showed that the north was with them in their policy as to reconstruction congress met in december eighteen sixty six and at once set to work to carry out this policy first of all it passed the tenure of office act to prevent johnson dismissing republicans from office then it passed the reconstruction act Johnson vetoed both of these measures, and Congress passed them both over his veto. The Reconstruction Act was later amended and strengthened. It will be well to describe here the process of Reconstruction in its final form. First of all, the seceded states, with the exception of Tennessee, were formed into military districts. Each district was ruled by a military officer who had soldiers to carry out his directions. Tennessee was not included in this arrangement because it had accepted the 14th Amendment, but all the other states, which had been reconstructed by Lincoln or by Johnson, were to be reconstructed over again. The franchise was given to all men, white or black, who had lived in any state for one year, excepting criminals and persons who had taken part in rebellion. This exception took the franchise away from the old rulers of the South. These new voters could form a state constitution and elect a legislature which should ratify the 14th Amendment. When all this had been done, senators and representatives from the reconstructed state might be admitted to Congress. 443. Impeachment of Johnson, 1868. President Johnson had vetoed all these bills. He declared that the Congress was a Congress of only a part of the states, because representatives from the states, reconstructed according to his ideas, were not admitted. He had used language towards his opponents that was fairly described as indecent and unbecoming the chief officer of a great nation. Especially, he had refused to be bounded by the Tenure of Office Act. Ever since the formation of the government, the presidents had removed officers when they saw fit. The Tenure of Office Act required the consent of the Senate to removals as well as to appointments. Among the members of Lincoln's cabinet who were still in office was Edwin M. Stanton. Johnson removed him, and this brought on the crisis. The House impeached the President, and the Senate, provided over by Chief Justice Chase, heard the impeachment. The Constitution requires the votes of two-thirds of the Senators to convict. Seven Republicans voted with the Democrats against conviction, and the President was acquitted by one vote. 444. The French in Mexico. Napoleon III, Emperor of French, seized the occasion of the Civil War to set the Monroe Doctrine at defiance and to refound a French colonial empire in America. 
At one time, indeed, he seemed to be on the point of interfering, to compel the Union government to withdraw its armies from the Confederate states. Then Napoleon had an idea that perhaps Texas might secede from the Confederacy and set up for itself under French protection. This failing, he began the establishment of an empire in Mexico with the Austrian prince Maximilian as emperor. The ending of the Civil War made it possible for the United States to interfere. Grant and Sheridan would gladly have marched troops into Mexico and turned out the French, but Seward said that the French would have to leave before long anyway. He hastened their going by telling the French government that the sooner they left, the better. They were withdrawn in 1868. Maximilian insisted on staying. He was captured by the Mexicans and shot. The Mexican Republic was reestablished. 445. The Purchase of Alaska, 1867. In 1867, President Johnson sent to the Senate for ratification a treaty with Russia for the purchase of Russia's American possessions. These were called Alaska and included an immense tract of land in the extreme northwest. The price to be paid was $7 million. The history of this purchase is still little known. The Senate was completely taken by surprise, but ratified the treaty anyway. Until recent years, the only important product of Alaska has been the skins of the fur seals. To preserve the seals' herds from extinction, the United States made rules limiting the number of seals to be killed in any one year. The Canadians were not bound by these rules, and the herds have been nearly destroyed. In recent years, large deposits of gold have been found in Alaska and in neighboring portions of Canada, but the Canadian deposits are hard to reach without first going through Alaska. This fact has made it more difficult to agree with Great Britain as to the boundary between Alaska and Canada. 446. Grant elected President, 1868. The excitement over Reconstruction and the bitter contest between the Republicans in Congress and the President had brought about great confusion in politics. The Democrats nominated General F. P. Blair, a gallant soldier, for Vice President. For President, they nominated Horatio Seymour of New York. He was a Peace Democrat. As Governor of New York during the war, he had refused to support the national government. The Republicans nominated General Grant. He received 300,000 more votes than Seymour. Of the 294 electoral votes, Grant received 215. End of chapter 42